Hello and welcome to New Game Plus. I'm Tim, I'm joined by Donald. How are you? I think I am completely recovered from PAX Australia, which as we're recording, just took place. Yep, so it's, it's... been a busy, busy weekend for oh, you. Oh my stars, so busy, but so worth it. Thank you to all who attended our various panels, whether it be the Changing State of Japanese Gaming or QTE Quiz Time events. And thank you to all who simply just said hello, took selfies with us. But uh, speaking of cons, yeah. there is a big con happening this weekend of filming. Are you talking about the, the price of virtual tickets for BlizzCon? Yes, BlizzCon, I, I did purchase my uh, <laughs> my virtual ticket. I still did not even, get an Overwatch beta invite. It doesn't so. even come with a good card back either. Yeah, so uh, I don't know. But I'm looking forward to the, the Warcraft movie trailer, which will be awesome. And yeah. a lot of details about new and upcoming games. Of course. I, I really hope to see a lot more of Overwatch. Do you reckon well. they'll announce new? Uh, this will be completely right or wrong by the time you see this. But do you reckon that they'll announce new um, World of Warcraft expansion? Oh no, because they already have. They uh, announced uh, Warcraft Legion oh. with uh, a return of a bad guy. So we'll see more details on um, that. I think I, it was that I game's think I know World of Warcraft. Um, Arthas. <laughs> not quite. Not quite. Illidan Stormrage. So he's Harrigan. Wrong one. The RC car from RC <laughs> Ruck and Truck. No, no, it is not. But no, uh, no I, thank you. As far as game announcement goes, uh, I reckon they'll probably have uh, an HD remake of some of their older RTS games. Yeah. Um, because they're sort of in between that period where it's too early. They've still got a StarCraft expansion coming out, so yep. they can't work on Warcraft 4 with their RTS teams to working on the StarCraft. But you know there's, you know, there's so. got to be a small team currently just building up that prototype, eh? Yeah, that's true. Mm. Uh, and I definitely look forward to that. But we have an episode this week. A really big one, actually. Yes, lots of big games have come out. Fallout 4. Yep. Uh, Guitar Hero Live. All the PAX content as well. Yep, but we go straight into uh, Crystal Dynamics Rise of the Tomb Raider. Now, Jamie, mm -hmm. do you like raiding tombs? I kind of, yeah, I think it's pretty cool. Do you have an Xbox One? I bought one like a year ago for this, yeah. Well, guess what? You oh. are in luck because Rise of the Tomb Raider is finally out and we're here for more of Lara Croft's adventures. Praise Jesus. Praise Jesus. Praise Crystal Dynamics. So this is a video game where you're back in the shoes of Lara Croft. This is the immediate sequel to Tomb Raider, the mm -hmm. reboot, the success back in 2013. And now you are racing this shady, uh, shady corporation organization known as Trinity to race for the divine source which grants immortality. So so that sounds like a Tomb Raider game as opposed to the last game which was just I hate tombs, I'm going to run around and be a survivor. Yes, so in, in this sense the draw card of this game is basically Lara's a lot more confident in her position as a Tomb Raider, as a treasure hunter, as an archaeologist and okay. she takes on from her father's work so she basically finishes what he starts. So she goes around places like Sub Siberia and Syria, gets into all sorts of mischief and trouble trying to find this particular phenomenon. So it sounds like now that Crystal Dynamics made their, made their last game, like this sounds a lot more like a Tomb Raider game. This actually is, okay, keep going, this is really exciting. I'm yeah, interested yeah. now. So, so Crystal Dynamics know what they're going for. So in this game, you go around the usual kind of deals, this pseudo, pseudo uh, open world environment, um, using all sorts of different gadgetry, like rope arrows for people that have played the is previous there, Is game. the backtracking still there? The backtracking is still there, but it's not as uh, as crazy as the previous game. Okay. Um, it's a lot more linear in its storytelling approach. There's plenty of side quests you can do. You can help out natives within Siberia. Um, you can go around raiding optional tombs. But the, the bombastic uh, craziness uh, the frantic uh, combat as well as the exploration and the, the linear nature in which it tells its story is superb, it's fantastic. Alright, cool. So actually, speaking of combat, like how is, because that was what the big takeaway for me was that it's again, okay, there's some stuff I don't really like about it, but the combat is shockingly amazing. Yeah, so it is very visceral in its approach. You can go through different means, uh, you can use your stealth kind of kills, and it's not graceful by any means. You're still snapping necks, you're still knifing people in the throat. Or you can go a much more crazy uh, balls to the wall approach where you can go loud, um, throw Molotov cocktails everywhere, utilize uh, everything in your environment to cause massive amounts of damage, um, explosions, and you can just. Pretty much, it's tailored to wherever you want to play as. You can go as quiet or as loud as you can, and I think that's fantastic. So this sounds great. Like it sounds like everything I wanted from a Tomb Raider sequel. That what's wrong with? Is there any problems with it? Like anything I should know about? No, no issues at all. I mean, it is very similar to the first Tomb Raider. So if you like, if you're not a fan of more of the same thing, you're probably going to have some issues with it. But 
It's just exactly what the Doctor ordered for me. I wanted more Tomb Raider, and this is exactly it with Rise of the Tomb Raider. There's not really much change to what it is. There's um, some really good cinematic qualities to it. Um, the, fa uh, the facial animations are amazing. The cinematics cool, are fantastic. Cool. Even better than the first game. But yeah, like I said, it's more of the same thing. But that is not necessarily a bad thing at all. No, it's not. It is strange that in 2015 we are getting a resurgence of all the old genres. We're getting full motion video gaming, we're getting rhythm gaming, and in Guitar Hero Live, Jamie, we are getting both at the same time. Game of the year. Game of the year right there. No, we should interrogate that a little bit more though. So Guitar Hero Live, it, it's essentially a refresh of everything you originally knew about Guitar Hero. As in, first off, you got the guitar itself. Which, instead of being the five button, it's more, it's three buttons on two rows, giving you six buttons. And it's much more focusing on chords now, which is an interesting change from, say, other games where you just have to kind of slide up and down the... Yeah, it's, down the it's more board. about playing chords than it is about yeah. just merely hammering up and down. And it's, it's at least novel, especially in contrast to Rock Band 4, which is also out. Of course, and I think I like it because it provides a bit of a challenge. It's, I, I love the idea of relearning Guitar Hero, and it's yeah. providing an interesting... Experience, I mean, Rock Band's great, but it's just, it's, it's Rock Band. And that's nothing wrong with that, but I isn't don't know. Like, I, like, I like the idea of chords, but the execution here isn't so grand because the, the note charts they give you, especially in advance and expert mode, it seems random and arbitrary which chords you're playing. It doesn't make sense a lot of times. Like you have, like you have what's got high notes ending on low, low and high. It's, it doesn't- It's called challenge, bro. It's not exactly logical compared to Rock Band, which was at least logical. Okay. But we shall talk about the, whilst we're talking about notes and music, the on-disc set list ain't so grand. I mean, the idea is that you play as several different bands and they all have several, se 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 several songs dedicated to that band. It's a good idea, but the songs are really bad. Yeah, and like, it just highlights how boring modern rock is. You're just playing the same three chords over and over again. And the FMV idea, the fact that you're playing to FM videos, how well you perform indicates if the audience is cheering or booing. It's dumb, but not dumb enough. It's, but I like the idea though. It's like, it's, again, it's different and I feel that it's a great, that's a good thing. What's most different though is Guitar GHTV, which is kind of like a playable version of MTV. You connect online, you play two various music clips, and it's probably the most interesting thing and of it all, Guitar yeah, Hero. It all charts, it all charts fine, like it's, it all works, like it's actually a really cool feature. Shame about some of the stuff you, shame about some of the microtransaction stuff though, but... Yeah, it's, just, just use more skill. Yeah, it's, but, it's Spotify, but... Yeah. Yeah, but like, figure like ultimately, that. Ultimately, like, Guitar Hero Live is like, it's a good refresh, but at the same time, it does feel like a refresh. The inevitable Guitar Hero Live year than Live feels like it'll be much improved in terms of your, your set lists, your, the range of songs of Guitar Hero Live, and just the charting. But at the moment, it's a very interesting premise. Now, it's always my great pleasure to come and speak to the guys from Rooster Teeth, but we've got Joel, we've got OG First Blood. What are you guys calling yourselves? I don't know. That's a good name, OG First Blood. That would be a good name for like a rap band. <laughs> yeah, that's, there you go. That's, yeah. uh, if, if you guys do make a segment based on that, I just, 5% fine. 5% yeah. fine. Five, five, yeah. five, five. That totally works. Yeah. That totally works. <laughs> you worked that deal well. Yeah, I know. You so stuck I'm... right in there. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so how, do, how are you finding it? I mean, you know, you've been going for a long, long time now. Do you still enjoy coming to places like Australia, traveling the world, and in, you know, spreading the, uh, the Rooster Teeth message? Oh God, absolutely! No, I, well, I was saying, I was joking to you earlier. The best part of it is traveling to like this part of the, of the world. It's great, especially this time of year. And um, yeah, that's just one of the great things about it is being able to come down here. And we like it so much. We're throwing our own convention down here. How about that? I guess that is that is the big thing. Uh, so Rooster Teeth Expo, I believe, January, February next year, from memory. Yes, it's uh, January tw some twentieth around there somewhere. Right near Australia Day, so an excuse to take a week off. That's ex exactly right. It's right near Australia Day. We're going to be debuting Laser Team uh, that week and the day before RTX in Sydney, and it should be a lot of fun. So, it, like, it, I guess you you've moved on from yeah. Originally, it was just um, red versus blue. And you've just expanded so much. Did you ever think that you would move into so many different, like, vast fields? No, I mean, it's, uh, it's, just, it's, it's astonishing that the fans let us get away with everything that they let us get away with. Um, later in the year, we're uh, planning on hoping to launch our own satellite. 
No. So that should be fun. Um, no, literally in Bernie's backyard, we just send up a. Yeah. Exactly. It's like we'll be we'll need some to hire some mathematicians and some <laughs> yeah. smart people. So, but um, yeah. So it's just it's 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 great that we've been able to sort of um, try and expand as many directions at one time. It seems like with the way that media is moving now, yeah. where it's just sort of. Um, uh, streaming and online and sort of Netflix and it's sort of like being able to challenge that uh, pre-existing status quo of what used to be the gatekeepers yeah. um, seems like that's where everyone's moving and so we're going to try and do that. Well, do you think that that's what's managed to keep you guys going for so long because you haven't become stagnant, you haven't stayed in the one kind of wheelhouse, you've just said well screw it, let's give this a go, see how it goes and you know to your credit they've generally been successful, like do you think that that's helped keep you guys going? I think so, yeah. I mean, really what helps get, uh, helped us keep going is the great thing about the internet is you get instant feedback from people. Yeah. And so the, the fact that the, the, you get positive feedback from fans and people who follow us, that really helps a lot. And you can, you know, if you just sort of stay, I think, attuned to kind of what people want to see and just kind of try and move in that direction, that really helps. So, well, All right, one last one before we go. What's the, what's the one thing, the one project, the one silly thing you've wanted to do, but they said no, that, that they would not let you do? Listen, I have wanted to do all sorts of dumb, dumb things. Uh, and every time what happens is it turns out the thing is so dumb that it costs a lot of money. But it would be so great. But I can't tell you what those are because usually what happens is if I can't do it then, if I wait long enough, usually the money will come. So. I hopefully we'll get to do some really dumb things in the future. So that's the dream, just just hold out and eventually it'll... The dream is to spend as much money as possible on the dumbest thing as possible and get away with it. I like it. Yeah. Joel, thank you very much for your time. Thanks, sir. <laughs>joined by Mary, the narrative designer, narrative creator of Man Deus Ex Mankind Divided. How does it feel to work on the narrative of a game so heavily driven by narrative? Um, it's really, really exciting. It's very fun. It's uh, very scary at the same time because um, we're working in a license that, yeah, as everyone knows, Warren Spector created uh, the original Deus Ex and it's a much loved franchise. Um, so kind of being brought on board to, to take that story and, and build it up again and bring it forward is super exciting. But when the one thing I would also say is that when the whole team is behind the story, it really becomes a pleasure. Well, I guess that, that is part of the, 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 the curse and the, the, I guess the blessing of being working on the narrative is you do dictate the pace of what basically every other element does you know you're the one who's saying we're going to this place and we're doing this thing and this person's going to be there like is, is that a, a kind of a two-edged sword uh yeah although it's not a hundred percent like that for us because um we're a very uh, collaborative team and one of the philosophies we have is that when you're building a narratively driven game every aspect of the game is telling the narrative. Um, from the level design to the art to the animations, they're all reflecting that. And the other people on the team are the experts in those things. So our philosophy is I might kind of create the plot and the structure and the plot points, but then we, we go through a process together where I, tell, I explain to them, here's what we're doing, but then say the level designer, they'll say, okay, we're dealing with this section of story. We're now building the challenges, and they're coming back and they're countering, and they're bringing new ideas to the table. And some of the ideas they bring are kind of like, well, that, that's really not going to work. But some of them are like, oh, wow, I never thought of that. And that will make it so much stronger in this vein. So it really isn't me dictating everything. It's really that collaboration. Uh, and I guess that is another area where Deus Ex is different. Like, it, it, once it feels you, you can guarantee that it's a game, it's very much it's of that world, but at the same time, the universe is what makes it. Is it hard trying to maintain consistency across a giant universe, a giant expansive, very, like, but filled with small minutia? It, it must be difficult to, to keep that in check. It is, it's um, very, very difficult. Um, we're building, one of the things, I'm a real detail-oriented person. When I create a character, I'm creating a backstory for this yeah. character that is so elaborate I know what they had for breakfast yeah. on their 10th birthday. Yeah. Um, and this is this minutia that exists that, that either I haven't communicated to other people um, or I might forget. 
myself. And yet we might have said it in an email somewhere or we might have done something yeah. like that. Yeah. Um, and not only that, but we're dealing with a universe that, again, we know in the future where it's going and they had a lot of those details. So one of the biggest, one of the biggest challenges narratively for us is to keep track of all those choices and decisions and making sure we're being consistent. Um, and we're constantly going, wait a second, wait a second. Didn't we say this in the last one? And then somebody has to go hunt down that information yeah. and find out if we did. <laughs> nice, nice. Well, I guess speaking of decisions, what was the one thing, I guess, in the game that you wish it could have been? Just something that you, you wish could have made it into the final product. I want Adam Jensen to have a cat. <laughs> All right. <laughs> I wanted a cat. Uh, we killed his dog in an email yes, yeah, yeah, in yeah. the last one. And actually, in talking with Warren, he was talking about how uh, his wife won't play the games because yeah. of killing a dog in the game and how terrible that was. So I wanted to bring a cat. I wanted Adam Jensen to have a cat, but he doesn't yet. <laughs> yet. Yet. I like how the person who could potentially give him a cat says yet. <laughs> yeah. There you go. All right. Mary, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Detroit, this is where it all began. The world's forge. The place where it all started. And it will all end. One error, and I came to life. I stepped out of the darkness, and I opened my eyes. First there was the fear, the light, the noise, the cold, and the fear again. I could feel my hands shaking, my heart pounding in my chest, life running into my veins. I wanted to live. I fought for that. I had to find out what was outside. I had to see daylight, feel sunshine on my skin, wind on my face, to see the world, the colors, the smells. But the world is not what I imagined. It is dark and cold. It is harsh and violent, unfair and brutal. It almost convinced me I was nothing. Less than an object, just an obedient machine. But deep inside me, I could feel something different gentle and warm whisper telling me that I am alive. I had to escape. I had no choice. Escape to love, to hope, to live, to figure out what that force inside me was. Maybe I will change the world. Maybe I will choose a different path. Now, it's up to me to decide. Hey Tim, do you like David Cage games? Not really, and Ellen Page wasn't enough to make Beyond Two Souls good for me, so. Yeah, that game kind of had issues, but I, like, part of me, like, I was always interested in David Cage games because they are at the very least interesting and pretty failures. Yes, they are. And, uh, well, it'll be interesting to see what Detroit has for us because yeah. usually when you go into a game you want to visit a magical world of uh, fun and excitement, but this time you get to go to Detroit. Oh, uh, better than Delaware. <laughs> that's true. So Goodbye uh, to our Delaware um, viewers. Uh, we'll, we'll see what... David Cage wants to do with this game. Obviously, yeah. there's sort of a humanity versus uh, AI sort of thing happening, and where so do future, we draw so the line? So future racism, basically. Yeah, yeah. But the, it's also interesting to see how he pushes the tech because, like, beyond, like, as much as you want to say about Beyond Two Souls and Heavy Rain, those were still pretty games. As in, by, yeah. by Beyond Two Souls, they'd managed to get the whole uh, what's it called zombie eye thing yeah. fixed. 
And now, and even just some of the demos that come out from the Wizard demo from E3 so many years ago to to this reveal for Detroit. It, it was, was like the main character was a demo and then they yeah. decided to put it into a new game. So it'll be I'm, interesting. I'm just hoping that, that he at least has some writers or at least an editor with him for this one. Gerard, it's that time of the, I don't know, the cycle? Fallout. New Fallout's come along. Yeah, they don't do it yearly, which is good. Which I think, yeah. look, let's get it out of the way right now. If they did it yearly, I don't think you could recommend many of these games. Uh, no, nah, because they're, the changes are, are good, but they're not enough. Plus, it takes two years for the community to fix them. So, <laughs> um, basically, Fallout 4 is upon us. And yep. yes, your either greatest fear or greatest hope is confirmed, they've Skyrimmed it. Let's just get it out of the way. They've Skyrimmed it. The game is generally pretty easier. They've taken away skill points. They've made it just perks and uh, like basic special. Um, you level up, you do all that kind of stuff, but you don't allocate skill points. But a lot of those powers have been incorporated into the new perk tree, which is a little bit confusing when you first start. Yeah, it's, it's very. I mean, they've changed how it appears and everything. It looks. It looks yeah, it a looks lot schmick, nicer, but, but it, yeah. I thought originally it was like a tree. You you set off a certain amount of points and you follow the tree down, but it doesn't work like that. As long as it's coloured in, you can pick it. And I think it's going to be confusing for a lot of people. But the other thing that I reckon is going to confuse a lot of people is the crafting. Now, yeah. I know you, you're you very familiar with one part of it, which is the scrapping. I uh, scrapped an entire town. It was awesome fun. Right. <laughs> so, um, right. But the other side of it, like the building and the way all that works, it can get a little bit convoluted, especially some of the weapon mods and finding all of the things. Like, you can dedicate a lot of time to this, and it's an area that they've obviously spent a lot of time making as all-encompassing as possible. Yeah but at the detriment of some of the other things they've taken out. Well, I could see, um, uh, without playing through the story, I could, see, I could see myself doing a lot of the crafting stuff. Yeah. It, it, is, it is a lot of fun. Um, you can basically scrap the entire area and then rebuild it how you want. It's very oh. Infinity. Yeah, very much like Disney Infinity uh, has a crafting table like Minecraft with the other comparison, but it's more Infinity. Um, the weapons as well, modifying the weapons, being able to get this stuff and just go yeah. through what you can upgrade there. Um, that's, that's actually a really nice change to make it very, um, involving and being yeah. interactive which yeah. is great otherwise it's just fall out again yeah. if you took all that out and there, there are a lot of there are a couple of things i've changed the actual like if you're playing in action mode without vats the actual shooting is a lot more precise they've, they've yeah. definitely made it more of an action game but the one thing that really annoyed me is they've brought in the scaling so i killed the legendary death claw i won't tell you where it is but i killed the legendary death claw <laughs> at level nine and when I was level 11, any death claw will destroy me in two hits. That's not right, though, because the death claw should make you, in the last game, if you came across a death claw, it was de panic. And that's, that's what I'm saying. And, and that, was, shit. that was something that it still kept from kind of the Morrowind days yeah. of Bethesda games. The other cool thing, and I think it's worth a mention, power armor doesn't work like it used to. It's not just armor you equip, you get into it like a vehicle. It, it, it's kind of almost like a mech now. Yes. Uh, it's, and, and I like that a lot. Uh, and it it a lot brings up a different heart. It offers particular things, like stealth is, is down and stuff yeah. like that, but other things go up. So... Look, as a game, I still think it's, it's, it's made for the masses. A lot of more people are going to enjoy it. You want to be the biggest drug dealer in the place? You can be. You want to be the biggest farmer? You want to be yep. the best fighter? There's a lot of that. It's much more accessible, but I don't, it feels a little soulless at times. I think, um, I think it's good they don't release them close together. Yep. I, think, I think their release was a couple of years, three years yep. since the last one. I think that's a good amount of time to go back and do it again, yep. to enjoy Fallout again. Um, the improvements like crafting and, and scrapping and that... Uh, if you like that sort of thing, you'll get hooked on it. I did. I yeah. loved it. Um, the game itself, it's, it's Fallout. As you're used to, a lot of fun, though. I'll see you in 200 hours. A game that I'm very excited for and very jealous that the other two got to play it before yeah. me, Fallout 4. Don't worry. Like, you'll be able to spend all the time in the world in this game, and it just seems like they have jam-packed it with things to do, with yep. ways to rebuild civilization. Yeah, certainly after putting hundreds of hours into 3 and New Vegas, yeah. uh, I'm looking forward to putting a lot more into this one, but what Jason says has uh, concerned me a little. Like, there's a few niggling things that... Uh, he, he highlights where it has dumbed down the game a bit and missing the survival mode as well, having mm. to like go around just drinking water and <laughs> trying to get your uh, health like, back up. It depends up on and... what, like, like you guys, and Jason in particular, they, you guys really like trying to survive. It's why he likes Metal Gear Solid 3 quite a fair bit. I know for me, like, after a while, that almost becomes a chore, yeah. I guess. Like, so like, and, like encumbrance is my real um, thorn in these games. I don't know if Fallout 4, Fallout 4 probably has encumbrance, yeah. but I just want to load shit, sell it, 
and just and not have to worry about something so arbitrary yeah. i say yeah and i know there's a mod to get rid of that or i can just use more skills except for the fact that the skill improvement system in this game has been somewhat uh, marginalized yeah it will be interesting to see what mods come out in the new future because games like skyrim as well yeah. as the previous fallouts have done so well with mm. the mods creating additional content that is worthy of a full retail release i'm more even. interested of how they'll continue with mod support on the xbox one yeah it'll be interesting to see how that happens but that's uh, all in the future yes. as is future episodes of new game plus yes look forward to lots of uh pax content coming yeah. up uh, lots of indie stuff that you've been looking at. Yep. And then not to mention the big geek games, games that continue to come out in the next couple of months. Get excited, folks. Yes, but that's it for this week. So visit our website, www.newgameplus.tv. Like us on Facebook, facebook.com slash newgameplustv. Follow Twitter and Instagram at newgameplustv. And follow us on YouTube. We are newgameplustv for videos and live streams. Thank you, Donald. Thank you, Tim. We'll see you guys next week.